All right, so this is uh, Matthew for Beginners, lesson number three. We're in narrative number one, and uh, if you're following along in your Bibles, you need to open them to Matthew chapter one, and we'll be looking at that. Um, whoops, there we go. So let's do a little review, shall we? Just the, what we've done so far. Gospel of Matthew was written by Matthew, former tax collector, publican, who was personally called by Jesus to be one of his apostles. Uh, the early church leaders and historians of that period say that Matthew wrote this gospel somewhere between 64 and 69 AD. Uh, this gospel was widely circulated in the early church, generally accepted by uh, the church at that time as an inspired work by one of Jesus' chosen apostles, Matthew. Uh, I've also mentioned that uh, Matthew wrote this work and intended it to be a defense of the faith for Jewish readers because he's very careful to note how Jesus' actions and words fulfill specific prophecies about the Jewish Messiah. A lot of the other writers don't bother saying when Jesus did this it fulfills the prophecy of so and so, they just go ahead and give the, the narrative. But Matthew is very, very careful to say when Jesus does this thing or says this thing, it is to fulfill according to the prophet so and so. And so a Gentile would not be interested in that type of you know, proof, but a Jewish reader would be very interested in that type of proof, that's why he provides it. He's also careful to answer potential questions that Jews would naturally raise you know, concerning the Sabbath and the, the manner that Jesus was executed, he was crucified, and for a Jew, someone nailed to a tree, you know what I'm saying, this was a curse. So he's careful to explain that this is done, again, according to what was said concerning the Messiah. Uh, we also noted that Matthew's work is extremely well organized, consisting of six narrative sections. Remember I said narratives, are when someone describes he went here, he said this, he did that, so on and so forth, uh, alternating with five discourses. The discourses are conversations, dialogue, monologues that Jesus has. So you have a narrative, a discourse, a narrative, a discourse, a narrative, a discourse. Very well organized work. Uh, this organization of material made the book easier to study and memorize, and consequently it was often used by the early church as a training manual for new Christians. So not only Jewish readers found it you know, beneficial, the early church also found it a useful tool to teach uh, young Christians. So in our study, I've asked you to read ahead because we won't have time to read all the verses in our class period. And so in today's lesson, I'm going to be commenting on the material written in narrative number one, which includes Matthew 1 verse 1, to Matthew 4, verse 23. And I hope that you've already read this on your own. So let's start with uh, narrative number one, which talks about the genealogy of Jesus. Matthew chapter one, verses one to uh, 17. Now Matthew begins with Jesus' genealogy for a purpose. He begins with the genealogy to demonstrate that he, Jesus, is a legal descendant and heir of King David through Jesus' earthly father, Joseph. That's why the genealogy is there. Now, you need to understand that at that time, genealogical records were needed to prove land ownership, which had been allotted to the original 12 tribes. When Joshua came into the promised land, you know, the, the 12 tribes were allotted certain sections of land according to their size and number and so on and so forth. Well, genealogical records were kept throughout the ages uh, so that each successive generation would know who, whose land belongs to who. Where do I live? What land do I own? so on and so forth. That's how you could prove something, through the genealogical uh, records. Now, um, uh, what's interesting is that um, uh, you also prove through the genealogical records who could serve as priests. 
because the priests all came from one tribe, the tribe of Levi, and certain families. So if somebody was going to serve as a priest, he had to prove through the genealogical records that his family tree went all the way back to Levi. An interesting thing happened in 70 AD when the Romans came in and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. They not only burned the city and tore down the house and tore down the temple, they also destroyed the genealogical records that were contained in the temple. And so that meant after that time, the Jews could no longer prove through the records, through the written records, which tribe they belonged in, not only for the ownership of land, but no one could prove that they actually belonged to the tribe of Levi using the genealogical records. And so the priesthood was decimated largely because of this act in, in, uh, in, AD, in 70 AD. All right, now uh, there's a difference between Matthew's genealogy and Luke. Luke also records a genealogy in Luke chapter three, and the differences between the two genealogies are the following. If you've ever wondered why, why is Matthew providing a genealogy and then Luke provides, because they don't usually try to cover the same material. But when you look at the two genealogies, they're different, they're not the same. So why are they different? Well, here's a couple of reasons. Number one, Luke begins with Jesus and he works his way backwards to Adam. Matthew, on the other hand, begins with Abraham and he works his way down to Jesus. Okay? One difference. Second difference. Luke traces back through David's son, Nathan, and Matthew traces through David's son, Solomon. Now one reason for this, perhaps, is that Matthew gives the legal lineage through Joseph's descendants. And Luke may be giving the lineage via the blood lineage of marriage. Uh, royal ascendancy was based on the mat maternal relationship in that culture and not the paternal one, okay? Also, um, Matthew records five women in his genealogy also to demonstrate the royal character of the lineage and also to demonstrate that women were very much part of God's plan. One other reason he may have mentioned these women is to defend against attacks on Mary and her suspected fornication. Remember, uh, you know, Mary was with child before she was married to Joseph by the power of the Holy Spirit, and Joseph needed you know, a dream. God needed to speak to him to, to tell him it was okay to go ahead you know, and marry. But this was known in the community that Mary was pregnant before she was married to Joseph. And so there may have been some talk, there may have been some gossip, may have been some negative things said uh, about her. So Matthew includes, very interesting, he includes five women in his genealogy. But you notice the ones that I've put asterisks next to their name. Uh, Tamar, for example, uh, what did she do? And what did Rahab, what was Rahab? And, 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 and what did Bathsheba do? Were these upstanding women? If I recall, Bathsheba was the woman who slept with King David while she was married. Now we know by that story that you know, the king seduced her, but nevertheless, she was a, you know, she was a marked woman. She is not a woman of uh, uh, high moral character, let's put it that way. And Rahab, you know, what was Rahab's profession? Well, she was a prostitute. And Tamar also uh, had uh, a relationship with her father-in-law. So what's Matthew doing here? Well, Matthew is showing that God used even women who had been guilty of fornication, yet he used the, these women anyway in bringing Christ into the world. 
So if he would use women who were guilty of fornication, certainly he could also use a woman who was accused of being guilty, Mary, but in fact was not guilty. So it's a way of kind of tempering any type of uh, negative uh, talk concerning the mother of Jesus uh, who was uh, pronounced as the Messiah. All right, so let's go on, so a little preliminary stuff, let's go on to the announcement of the birth, that would be the next heading, chapter one, verses 18 to 25. So you see how I'm doing this? I'm doing the narrative and then I'm hitting the big, you know, the big uh, points here and commenting on, on each and allowing you to kind of fill in the notes here. So Matthew claims that this is a fulfillment of prophecy found in Isaiah 7:14. the idea that the, uh, the, 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 the birth of Jesus is announced. Matthew begins immediately demonstrating how every facet of Jesus' life was in line with everything spoken about the Messiah by the prophets. So everything they said about the Messiah in the Old Testament, Matthew wants to demonstrate that Jesus fulfilled every single one of those things. All right? I want you to note also that in verse 25, Matthew says that Joseph kept Mary a virgin until the birth of Jesus. And so just the way this sentence is put together, it assumes that this was not to be the case afterwards. And this is contrary to teaching in the Roman Catholic Church of Mary's perpetual virginity. This is taught in the Catholic Church, but it is in contradiction to what Matthew teaches here. Actually goes out of his way to say that she was kept a virgin until the birth, uh, which assumes, and of course we know in Mark, Jesus or you know, Mark mentions the name, the people name the names of Jesus' brothers and, and mentions that uh, the sisters that he had lived in that town. All right, the next um, heading is the wise men, right? Genealogy, then birth, then wise men, Matthew 2 verses 1 to 12. The term Meiji, I think that's the, I've, I've toyed with a lot of different pronunciations in English, uh, looked at all kinds of books, you know. Meiji is the, the closest one I can, I can come to. The Meiji refers to a class of priests and counselors and astrologers who served as royal counselors in Persia. Uh, so Mabel was asking me that before and uh, she was uh, accurately describing them. Uh, they were interpreters of signs. So through, they, they interpreted signs for the kings and for high government officials. And they did this through magic arts or divination. They used to read, you know how you read tea leaves? You know, you've, you've been to, you, know, you talk about people who take tea leaves. I remember in my family, one of my aunts could claim that she could read tea leaves. And what you do is, of course, you couldn't use a tea bag, obviously. You know, she made natural tea with tea leaves. And then there are always leaves at the bottom of your cup. When you finish drinking, you turn the cup over and then you, you know, and she would spin it three times. You know, then she'd look in, and at the leaves and she would say, ah, oh, I see here, you're going to go on a trip or whatever. You know, she'd read tea leaves. My Aunt Madeleine used to do that, Madeleine. Well, the Meiji, uh, they would not read tea leaves, they would read organs, livers. You know, things like that, human organs or animal organs, and uh, get a reading about the future or about the condition of the state or something to do uh, with the king uh, from their uh, readings. They also determined by the stars the birth uh, of a Jewish king. Uh, very interesting. Um, uh, they brought gifts with them. Uh, we don't know if it's three Meiji or 50 Meiji. We know there were three gifts. Uh, there's some historical confirmation of the star that they saw in some history. The conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn somewhere around 7 BC. Uh, the evanescent star that was reported in Chinese records around 4 BC. You know, there are always people trying to uh, give natural explanations to miraculous things. So there, there's some writings that talk about some sort of unusual happening in the heavens at around that time. 
Um, these Meiji were ignorant of Herod's political situation. Herod was the king at that time, very evil man. We need to note the fact that the exact location was not determined by the star, but by the word of God. The star was a sign, but it merely confirmed the word because when they wanted to know where the, uh, the Messiah was to be born, they didn't look at the star and try to figure that out. They went to the word. They went to Micah chapter five, verse two. And in Micah chapter five, verse two, they found that the prophet had said that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Okay? Also note that it was Herod who sent them to Bethlehem. He said, well, you go ahead and you, you find the child, you let me know where he is. I think that's a familiar story. So their presence also symbolized the importance of the birth of Christ to the Gentile world as well, and also their worship of Him signified His divine and royal character. Okay? So there's a little bit of background about the Meiji, the wise men. Next heading, uh, escape to Egypt and the return. Matthew 2, verse 13 to 23. This is about a 200 mile trip. Some scholars think uh, they may have gone to Alexandria because there was a large Jewish population in Alexandria at the time in Egypt. The prophet Hosea, chapter 11, verse one. This is the Old Testament prophecy that Ma uh, Matthew claims is fulfilled. Matthew is saying the fact that the baby Jesus went, had to escape to Egypt and then come back out he says this trip, this event here was prophesied, was spoken of by Hosea chapter 11 verse 1. And so there's a parallel here between Israel, right? Uh, through Joseph's role, Israel, I mean you know, Joseph, uh, the, 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 Jacob's son, not Joseph, Jesus' dad, but uh, Jacob's son, you know, what happened to him? He went into Egypt, he was sold into slavery, and then eventually he came out, didn't he? They brought his bones out, so there's a parallel. Jesus went into Egypt to escape, you know, uh, so on and so forth, and then eventually um, he came back, he came back out. Now, uh, it's mentioned in Matthew that Archelaus, who was Herod's son, um, uh, was on the throne, so Herod dies, Joseph and Mary figure, okay, it's safe to go back because they, they were told to escape while Herod was there because Herod wanted to kill the, the baby. Herod dies, Joseph decides to go back. Archelaus is Herod's son, also wicked. This man had killed over 3,000 people during the Passover in revenge for opposition to him. So Joseph you know, avoided settling in or around Jerusalem uh, for fear of this ruler. Again, in a dream he finds out. And you know, you know, you think, why would he go back to Jerusalem to settle? He's not from Jerusalem. He was born in Bethlehem. He lived up in the north. Why would he go back to Jerusalem? And the thought is, well, he's had a time, a couple of years now, to think about this baby Jesus and uh, you know, the, 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 the miraculous way that he's born, uh, the, the, the Meiji coming to him and worshiping him, that uh, he's beginning to get the idea that this is a, this is a king, this is an important person, this is, the, this may, this is the Messiah. Well, you know, if you're a dad and you're in charge of the Messiah, uh, where do you think is a good place to settle and live? Well, if it was me, I figure, well, we might as well go live near the temple. We might as well go live at the center of Jewish religious life. I mean, if my son is going to be the savior, you know, surely this is where he needs to be. And so uh, he's warned in a dream, and uh, so he avoids Jerusalem, and they go back to Nazareth. And in doing this, going back to Nazareth, the prophecy concerning what Jesus would be known as is fulfilled. He was going to be known as the Nazarene but he wouldn't have been known as the Nazarene had he settled in Jerusalem. So you have the wisdom of man versus the wisdom of God here. Okay? Interesting also is that the term Nazarene ultimately became a term of derision by the Jews in reference to Christians. The Talmud calls Jesus, remember we talked about the Talmud, you know, uh, 
uh, writings that comment on the Torah, which is the law. Okay? There were Jewish writings, commentaries. In the Talmud, when they refer to Jesus, they refer to Him as the Nazarene. It's like calling somebody by their last name. You know, if you're going to call uh, Jack Brown, uh, Mr. Brown, well then you're giving him respect. If you're calling him Jack, well then you know, you're, you're familiar. But if you're just saying, hey Brown, come over here, you're neither giving him respect, nor are you showing any type of friendliness. It's a term of derision. So calling Jesus the Nazarene was a term of derision that they used. Also, the typical synagogue prayer curses Christians as Nazarenes. So when they refer to Christians, the Jews did at the beginning, when they referred to them as Nazarenes, this wasn't a term of endearment, it was a term of derision. Uh, in Acts chapter 2 verse 45, uh, we know that this began very early because the Jewish lawyer uh, Tertullian, who was accusing Paul, remember they brought lawyers to accuse Paul and try to get him in trouble, uh, this uh, Jewish lawyer referred to Christians as the sect of the Nazarene. Again, a term of derision. Okay, so let's go on to the next heading, which would be John the Baptist, chapter three, verses one to 17. The appearance of John the Baptist was also in fulfillment of the prophecies concerning the Messiah. In Matthew three, or in Matthew three, yes, verse three, it says that the prophet said that before the Messiah would come, there would be a forerunner who would precede him and prepare the people for his arrival. Isaiah chapter 40, verses one to five. So he just keeps hammering away. In Isaiah, Isaiah said there would be someone coming before the Messiah to prepare his way. And then Matthew says, well, John the Baptist, he's the one that fulfills that prophecy back in Isaiah 40. In describing John the Baptist, Matthew claims that he is the one whom the prophets were referring to as the forerunner. Interesting thing, how does, how does John the Baptist get the authority to teach? Like who made him a teacher all of a sudden? Well, you need to think about who he is. John was born from a priestly family. Zacharias was his father, and his father was a priest. And so, his right to preach and teach was never questioned by the Jewish people because he was the son of a priest, but he did not take the, the normal pathway that the priests took, serving at the temple and so on and so forth. He took another direction. All right. uh, he worked and lived in the style of Elijah, the Old Testament prophet. Elijah was a his messages were always you know, what they call hell and fire, hell and brimstone preaching. Elijah was a very stern and a call to repentance and John the Baptist was similar. Some people believe that Elijah would indeed return and Jesus tells the people in Matthew 11 that John was the embodiment of this prophet. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't uh, Elijah resurrected, he, was, he embodied the spirit of this prophet. But John is, you know, he's not an Old Testament prophet, he belongs to the New Testament age, and his work is part of the gospel. So we know that John prepared the way through the wilderness. You know, he says, I'm, I'm in the wilderness, I'm preparing the way in the wilderness. Kind of a, a metaphor here for what was going on. The wilderness was the hardened hearts of the people. And John the Baptist prepared them through a message of repentance for the arrival of Jesus and the good news of the kingdom. So you know, the whole idea of his you know, breaking, you know, making a straight path or clearing the wilderness had nothing to do with geography. It had everything to do with the heart of the Jewish people that he was talking to. Their hearts were the wilderness. Their hearts were hard. Their hearts were crooked. He was trying to make a pathway so that that Jesus can go. And you know, God uses us that way too sometimes, right? Now we had a young man who was uh, baptized here uh, you know, a few days ago, and uh, uh, Ryan, and uh, the idea was there is a whole, a whole host of people in the church you know, that ultimately helped this young man 
make his decision to accept Christ in baptism, starting with the people who taught him in cradle row, uh, you know, and he was in Miss Jane's class for the you know, time travelers and Maybell, and then he went on, you know, and he was a, you know, a little kid running around like all the other little kids running up and down the stage at one time, even I can remember that, and then he was in the you know, junior grades, and then he was with the, the youth group and so on, and so a lot of people had a hand you know, maybe someone, maybe Marty or someone from the pulpit said something that just finally you know, turned the switch on, but a lot of people prepared the way. And so in the same sense, John the Baptist was there to prepare the way for the message. And I think we need to remember that sometimes God uses us as that, that last person you know, to finally you know, bring that person into the water or so on but sometimes he uses us as the first person to just give a good example or just to, you know. Some people say, you know what, I started thinking about God because I was over at McDonald's and I saw a guy sitting there and before he ate his hamburger, he stopped and he prayed and he closed his eyes for a moment and then he began to eat his hamburger. And that got me to thinking about you know, God and so on and so forth. And five years later, he was baptized. Well, that guy at McDonald's, he was the very first one that God used to prepare the way. All right? So this is how John the Baptist was used. His baptism was for the forgiveness of sin, uh, prepare, uh, preparation for entry into the kingdom of God and the spirit which Christ would give when Jesus would come. Uh, some people say, how did John the Baptist baptize? Well, you know this because of the words that are used. Uh, John the Baptist, or John the Immerser, baptized people by immersion. And we know that for several reasons, but mainly because of the words that are used. In the Greek, which is the language that the New Testament is written, the word to sprinkle water on someone is the word ranitzo. Ranitzo. So if I'm sprinkling, you know, if I'm baking and I have to sprinkle some, uh, you know, something on top of my food, I would use the word ranitzo. In the Greek, the word for pouring something is the word balo. Pour me a glass of water, I ballo you a glass of water. I don't, I don't rentizo you a glass of water, I ballo you a glass of water. And then the word baptizo is the Greek word used for immerse. I am going to take a bath, I'm going to baptizo, I'm not going to rentizo myself, I'm not taking a shower. I'm not going to ballo myself, you know, take a jug and pour water over my head, that, that would be ballo. I'm going to baptizo, I'm going to be in the bath, I'm going to immerse myself in the water. And so how do we know that that's the way they baptized? Because the word baptizo is the word that is used whenever the New Testament is referring to what we call baptism. It was John the baptizoer, you know, the, the immerser. And people came to him to be immersed. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, uh, uh, Peter says to the crowd, repent and let every one of you be immersed, baptizo, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and so on and, and so forth. Okay? So Jesus' own baptism by John was the turning point in the ministry of each of these two men. It was the beginning of Jesus' ministry and it was the climax and the beginning of the descent of John's ministry. Not that John did anything wrong, but he had achieved his purpose when Jesus came to him to be baptizo, to be immersed. After that, you see that the crowds following him lessen and the crowds following Jesus become greater. Matthew is the only gospel that records John's protest. You know, John says, no, 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 I, I, 
well, I'm not supposed to baptize you, you should be baptizing me, right? Remember that, you know, if you've read that? Matthew is the only one that records that little bit of dialogue between these two men. So Jesus' baptism was to inaugurate His public ministry, and it was also to comply with God's will in every respect, although for Him it was not for forgiveness sake, because we know He had no sin, it was rather to acknowledge that the kingdom of which He was the head was indeed at hand. Now's the time, it's the kickoff. So at the baptism of Jesus we see three persons of the Godhead clearly revealed and represented. Only time in scripture where all three are clearly seen or represented. The Father, you hear the voice from heaven. The Son, Jesus is there incarnate in the body of a, a man. And the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. So people who, you know, uh, they don't believe in the triune nature of God, you know, bring them to Matthew, show him this passage, have them explain it to you. Then why is God represented? Is Jesus God? Well, yeah. Uh, the voice from heaven, the Father, is that God? Uh, yeah. Well, how about the Holy Spirit, the dove, is that God? Well, yeah. So what's your point? <laughs> you know, how do you explain that? Well, we, we don't have all the words, but we use the term the Godhead. Okay? So it is the climactic point of this narrative, right here at this spot, where the deity of Jesus is presented so clearly, and it's the culmination of Old Testament prophecy about the initial appearance of the Messiah. I need to move just a little more quickly. Let's go from there to the next heading, which would be the temptations, Matthew 4, verses 1 to 11. So Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit into the desert to be tested by Satan. Now Satan has ruined the first Adam and now would use his full force to try to ruin the savior of the fallen Adam, which would be Jesus. He was tempted for 40 days, during which time he did not eat, and of which we have three recorded. We only see three of the temptations, but he was tempted for 40 days, but Matthew, the Holy Spirit, just gives us information on three temptations. Three recorded temptations, we see Satan doing various things. In the first one, he casts doubt upon God's word concerning Jesus' sonship, and he demands that Jesus supply proof beyond God's word by supplying for his own needs. In other words, if you're God, you know, if you are God, prove it to me, turn these stones into, into bread. Jesus responds that God's word is sufficient in all matters for His sonship as well as for the provision of His, of his need. You know, God's word is enough, He said. I don't, need to, I don't need to do an extra miracle on top of what God's word says. So if God's word tells me that I need to repent and be baptized, we were just talking about baptism, if God's word tells me you need to repent and be baptized for your sins, I don't need an additional miracle to prove to me that this is what God wants me to do. His word is plenty. I don't need more than that. And that's what, God, that's what Jesus is saying to Satan here. I, I, don't need, I don't need to make a miracle here. God doesn't need to make a miracle. His word is enough. Secondly, Satan um, misrepresents God's word. You know, he uses the word to say what it doesn't say. You know, that God will protect us no matter what we do. So Jesus responds by demonstrating his understanding of God's word in context. Yes, God will keep us, but we must not be presumptuous with him. He keeps his promises to the humble and the trusting, and he brings to naught the proud. In other words, don't push your luck. We're under grace, we know that. We know what's right, we know what's good. We're trying to do what's right and good. But we don't presume on God's grace. We don't, we don't do that. And then number three, very quickly, um, he wants Jesus or tempts him or tries to draw him to disobey God's word. So he appeals to Jesus' human nature by offering him something that the word of God doesn't offer and that is a crown without a cross. 
I'll give you a crown, all the world's you know, kingdoms, I'll give you that crown if you just worship me. So I'll give you a crown, but no cross. You won't have to go to the cross, okay? So he suggests that he is under God and has a right to offer these things if Jesus will place himself under Satan. So Jesus refuses to violate the first command of the law, the basic principle of the word, which is that we only worship God. And so Jesus rejects the word of Satan for the word of God, uh, and um, uh, even, if it means his own, even if it means his own death. And sometimes, uh, rejecting Satan and accepting God's word also means our death, not necessarily our physical death like we die, but maybe the death of a certain pleasure that we shouldn't be having, or the death of, 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 of something that we wanted but we shouldn't have. We have to accept sometimes that you know, in doing God's will, it will mean that it'll cause us some suffering of some kind. You know? No, no, you know the old, the old saying, right? There's no cross, you don't get a crown unless you go to the cross, you know. And we're the people of the cross, not the people of the crown. The crown comes later. So with his greatest temptation spurned, Satan is defeated and Jesus victoriously orders him away, after which the angels tend to his needs. You ever wonder, what were his needs? Well, he didn't eat for 40 days. How about that need? <laughs> How about the fatigue? Right? He was a man. All right, the last um, heading is uh, Matthew talks about Galilee and the disciples, chapter 4, 12 to 25. So by this time, John is in prison, he's beheaded. Jesus himself goes north to the area around the Sea of Galilee. And this, Matthew says, is the fulfillment of another prophecy in Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2, saying that the Messiah would be from that area and that area would have a great light, okay? So he begins his preaching around the area where he grew up, and that what he's preaching is pretty much the same message that John the Baptist is preaching. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the message that Jesus, you ever wonder, what, what, what was Jesus preaching? Well, he was preaching what John was preaching, okay? um, He builds upon John's ministry, uh, he calls particular disciples to train. He preaches away from Judea to the Gentiles. He goes inside of synagogues. He performs miracles. All of this done uh, in Galilee as he begins his uh, very public ministry. So Matthew's very first narrative establishes Jesus' genealogy, his birth, his lordship, and his ministry all in four very short chapters, okay? All right, so that's the first lesson. So let's, let's kind of understand how we're doing this. Next week, I'm going to do discourse number one. So that means you, if you have the time and the inclination, will read Matthew 5, 1 to Matthew 7, 29, and then on the sheets that I've given you tonight, you will list the headings, try to list the headings, you know, the subjects, the things that I'm going to be talking about, and also keep a little record of the things that you discover on your own, call them little gold nuggets, and then next week I'll give you another sheet and you can compare what you've done and what you've listed to what I have uh, given you. Again, this is a little different type, we always say Bible study, but this is really a Bible study. You actually have to study. You actually have to read and do a little bit of work. It'll be good for your soul and good for your spirit. All right, let's stop right there.